After a series of unexpected setbacks and intense last-minute fixes, Starship 37 has finally earned its ticket to Flight 10. But this road to flight clearance wasn't smooth. What went wrong? And how did SpaceX turn it around? Let's break down the drama step by step. Just days earlier, Ship 37 completed a back-to-back -back static fire campaign aimed at validating engine performance and the propellant delivery system. The first test lit a single engine using header tank propellants to simulate a deorbit burn, followed the next day by a full-duration six-engine firing to evaluate both vacuum and sea-level raptors. Afterward, the ship was removed from the orbital launch mount and returned to the production site for inspections and launch preparations. Meanwhile, ground crews dismantled temporary test hardware from the OLM, including the test stand and the ship QD system mounted over the booster QD hood to supply propellants, gases, and electrical power during testing. During inspections inside Mega Bay 2, engineers discovered an issue with one of Ship 37's Raptor vacuum engines, prompting a replacement and requiring another test before flight clearance. This sudden change of plan set off a cascade of work. The removed test stand was reinstalled on the OLM, while teams reconnected propellant feed lines and flexible hoses to reconfigure the temporary ship QD system for the next engine test. Following the engine swap and other hardware fixes, Ship 37 rolled out to the launch site on Monday afternoon. Upon arrival, it was lifted from its transport stand onto the OLM, where technicians manually secured the propellant delivery lines to the pre-installed shipside QD panel flanges. Electrical and data lines were also connected, and teams verified the ship's secure attachment to the test stand embedded in the mount. The first engine test attempt took place on Tuesday evening. Propellant loading into the ship began as scheduled, with frost lines forming and rising along the tanks, signaling smooth progress. But midway through fueling, a sudden visible venting revealed a developing leak in the flexible transfer hoses linking the main propellant supply lines to the ship. Fortunately, the leak occurred in the oxidizer line and not the methane fuel line, significantly reducing the risk of a catastrophic explosion. Such leaks can occur due to extreme cryogenic contraction, material fatigue, or damage to seals and couplings from prior operations. The teams immediately initiated abort procedures, safely draining the propellants and calling off the test for the day. Later that night, the faulty flex hose was removed and replaced with a new unit. Following installation, leak checks were performed to confirm system integrity, after which preparations began for a second spin prime attempt. On Wednesday morning, Ship 37 executed a flawless six-engine spin prime lasting about 10 seconds, roughly the length of a typical full-duration static fire. During the test, the engine's turbo pumps are spun up to operational speeds by flowing cryogenic propellants through the system without ignition. This process verifies the health of critical engine hardware, such as turbo pumps, valves, feed lines, seals, and sensors, while validating the startup sequence, checking for leaks, ensuring proper flow, and confirming the engine's readiness for actual ignition. Engine swaps and retests are common in the Starship program, especially with current Block 2 ships. Ship 35, used for Flight 9, faced multiple Raptor vacuum issues during testing, including premature shutdowns that required at least two replacements and a second test round. Even after passing, another engine showed abnormal behavior, prompting yet another swap and a final spin prime test before clearance. In-flight problems have also plagued recent Block 2 missions. Flights 7 and 8 suffered propellant leaks and cascading engine shutdowns, destroying the vehicle's mid-ascent. Flight 9 developed a recurring hotspot on its vacuum engine bell. While it completed ascent, the incident underscored ongoing vulnerabilities. Now Ship 37 has encountered similar vacuum engine complications during ground testing, hopefully resolved in the latest round. These persistent issues, particularly with vacuum raptors and their systems, reflect the challenge of producing a reliable, reusable, full-flow staged combustion engine. While Block 2 includes major design changes to engines and propellant systems, reliability is still being refined test by test. With testing complete, Ship 37 will soon return to the production site for post-test data review, system inspections, and final pre-launch work. If all six Raptors pass qualification, it will be flight ready after a few tasks, such as installing missing heat shield tiles and loading a batch of dummy Starlink satellites. These will serve as mass simulators and test articles for the payload deployment system released into a controlled suborbital trajectory during Flight 10's coast phase to validate both mechanical deployment and onboard control logic. 
Previous dummy payload tests failed due to door and actuator issues, making success here critical for future operational Starlink V3 launches. Booster 16, Ship 37's flight partner, has been in the rocket garden for a week, already completing all pre-flight milestones, including a full-duration static fire and hot staging ring installation, making it flight ready. Before Flight 10, SpaceX must restore the orbital launch mount to flight configuration by removing the static fire stand, reinstalling booster hold-down clamps, and dismantling the ship-specific QD hardware spliced into the main propellant lines. If work continues at this pace, Ship 37 and Booster 16 could roll out next week for full-stack assembly and final launch prep. According to the latest notice to Mariners, SpaceX is targeting no earlier than August 22nd for Flight 10. However, this remains a provisional date, contingent on FAA approval and vehicle readiness. In an interesting update, at Kennedy Space Center's LC-39A, NASA spaceflight cameras have spotted the Starship flame diverter under construction outside SpaceX's Horizontal Integration Facility. The water-cooled steel pipe network is complete, and rollout to Pad 39A appears imminent. Excavation for the flame trench has been underway for months at the pad and now seems in its final phase, aligning with preparations for diverter installation. Meanwhile, the launch mount is under construction at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, also nearing completion. Once complete, the LC-39A Starship launch pad's overall configuration will mirror Starbase's pad B. Near the flame trench, the launch tower is progressing toward operational readiness, with current work focused on the tower arms. The drawwork cable reeving is complete, paving the way for chopstick actuation tests to verify range of motion, load capacity, and precision, critical steps before handling Starship launches. Now, let's shift focus to two groundbreaking aerospace deals SpaceX has recently struck with Italy and South Korea. On August 7th, Italian Space Agency President Teodoro Valente announced a deal for Italy to send scientific experiments aboard Starship's first commercial missions to Mars. SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell confirmed the partnership, marking Starship's opening to international scientific payloads. The selected payloads include a plant growth experiment to study biological processes in extraterrestrial conditions, a meteorological station to monitor Martian weather patterns, and a radiation sensor to measure exposure levels during the six-month interplanetary transit to Mars and continue gathering information once Starship lands on the Red Planet. This deal makes Italy the first nation to secure a commercial agreement for dedicated Mars science payloads on Starship. The first uncrewed Starship missions to Mars are likely targeted for the next launch window in late 2026, contingent on everything proceeding as planned and on the success of in-orbit refueling, a critical enabler for deep space travel. These flights may also carry Tesla Optimus humanoid robots as stand-ins for human crews. SpaceX plans at least five uncrewed landers in this window to validate landing integrity and pave the way for larger-scale missions in future windows, aiming to send humans as early as 2030 if these demonstrations succeed. In another landmark deal, on August 1st, South Korea's Sphere Corporation signed a 10-year supply contract with SpaceX worth up to $1.05 billion for nickel and super alloys essential to next-generation rocket manufacturing. These high-performance materials are valued for their strength, corrosion resistance, and high-temperature performance, and are used in key structural and engine components, such as manifolds, valves, turbine blades, thrust chambers, and nozzles. While Starship's primary structure is stainless steel, nickel-based alloys improve the airframe's durability during repeated launches and re-entries. The materials will also support Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and Starlink satellite production, enhancing thermal control systems and corrosion protection for spacecraft electronics. The exact compositions and quantities of these materials remain undisclosed, but industry estimates suggest SpaceX consumes tens of thousands of tons of such alloys annually to sustain production, testing, and launch operations. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. China's ambitious lunar program reached a major milestone recently, as both the Lanyue crewed lunar lander and the Mengzhou crew capsule successfully completed critical ground tests, advancing the nation's goal of landing astronauts on the moon by 2030. China's manned lunar mission plan involves two Long March 10 launches from the Wenchang spaceport, one carrying the Lanyue lunar lander and the other transporting the Mengzhou crew vehicle. Once in lunar orbit, Mengzhou and Lanyue will perform automated rendezvous and docking, 
Two astronauts will transfer from Mengzhou to Lanyue, descend to the moon's surface for exploration and scientific work using rovers and instruments, then return to orbit, dock back with Mengzhou, and finally journey back to Earth. Lander Lanyue, meaning embracing the moon, is designed to transport two astronauts, a 200-kilogram rover, and scientific payloads safely to the lunar surface and back. Fully fueled, Lanyue weighs approximately 26,000 kilograms and is powered by four main engines, supported by multiple precision thrusters for maneuvering in lunar gravity. Its cylindrical shape includes four wide, shock-absorbing landing legs, engineered to ensure smooth touchdowns on uneven terrain. On August 6th, Lanyue completed a realistic lunar landing and ascent simulation at a specialized Chinese lunar landing test facility. Suspended by tethers to simulate lunar gravity, the test began with Lanyue performing controlled engine firings for a powered descent onto a mock lunar surface. Engine thrust was carefully modulated throughout the descent, using sensor feedback to enable a soft and controlled touchdown. After a brief simulated surface operation, the ascent engines reignited, lifting Lanyue off the surface and demonstrating its capability to perform lunar ascent. This phase verified the coordinated operation of the engine's flight control and navigation systems. Throughout the test, engineers closely monitored integrated lander subsystems, confirming safe, precise landing and ascent consistent with crewed mission requirements. Meanwhile, Mengzhou, or Dream Vessel, is China's next-generation modular crew capsule, capable of carrying up to six astronauts, or a combination of three crew and 500 kilograms of cargo. Mengzhou will launch the crew from Earth, maintain lunar orbit, enable crew and sample transfer with Lanyue via docking, serve as the lunar orbit command module during surface operations, and safely return the astronauts home. Mengzhou's key recent milestone was the zero-altitude launch escape test conducted in June at the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. During this emergency simulation, the integrated capsule and escape tower ignited, lifting off rapidly to a target altitude within 20 seconds. The capsule then separated from the escape tower, deployed parachutes, and landed precisely in the recovery zone. This test validated critical safety functions, including escape sequencing, separation mechanisms, and parachute deployment, necessary for crew safety during launch abort scenarios. Looking ahead, both Lanyue and Mengzhou will undergo further rigorous testing, including additional launch escape trials, orbital flight validations, long-duration environmental assessments, and landing and takeoff rehearsals. These milestones will lead to uncrewed demonstration missions in lunar orbit and on the surface, paving the way for China's first crewed lunar landing by 2030. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.